What's up guys and welcome back to the channel. We hope you're having a wonderful time so far, but if not, hopefully we'll be able to fix that since today we're going to be talking about the 7 biggest Shark Tank deals that flopped. Remember, if you're a fan of Shark Tank, go ahead and hit the like button and subscribe, and if you've done so, make sure to hit the bell notification icon so that you can be notified whenever we release our daily videos. Finally, make sure to let us know in the comments section below so that you can be featured in a video shout out at the end of the month. And with all that said, let's go ahead and get right into the video. First off, a note on Shark Tank. Apparently, 30% of entrepreneurs who got an investment said that the details of their deals changed off camera. That's weird. And Forbes also looked at what the Sharks did to change their deals after the episodes. Apparently, Mark, who closes more deals than any other investor, changed his on-air deals about 25% of the time. From Season 1 through Season 7, Damon changed his deals about 59% of the time, Kevin, 57, Barbara had 50% of her deals changed, Lori changed about 48% of her deals, and Robert had 45% of their deals changed. What this basically boils down to is sometimes a good entrepreneur makes the wrong deal with the wrong shark. When Nikki Pope pitched Toy Guru on the Shark Tank, she said that she should have gone with Mark Cuban. Robert was shaking my hand as Mark was meeting his offer. It all happened so fast that they had no time to think. I've heard nothing but great things about Mark from other people that he's invested in. But hindsight is 2020. So with that preface out of the way, let's go ahead and get right into it. Number one, sweet balls. Uh, Cole, did you have a product in this kind of retail environment before? Uh, I've, I've worked in the frozen food product uh, category, yes. Were any of your other enterprises successful? After Sweet Balls founders James McDonald and Cole Egger inked a $200,000 deal with Mark Cuban, the two owners actually got into a messy lawsuit when James sued Cole for breach of contract. Later, on the company's official website, Sweetballs.net, they began redirecting to Cakeballs.net, a site that Cole controlled. James subsequently filed a restraining order against his former business partner. James McDonald and Cole Egger pitched their bake sale company, Sweet Balls, to the Sharks in 2013. That was during the height of the cake ball madness. Mark Cuban gave the duo $250,000 for 25% of their company, but the madness only ensued after the show permitted. McDonald wound up suing Edgar for breach of conduct, and Edgar then got control of the Sweet Balls domain name and redirected it to a site promoting a renamed version of the product called Cake Balls. A few years later, and an alleged restraining order later, you can now visit SweetBalls.com, owned by McDonald. And doesn't it suck when your bake sale company ends up turning into a thousand dollar lawsuit as well as a restraining order? I remember that happening when I was a kid. Except I didn't, because that's not a thing that happens in the real world normally. That's, that, that's actually just weird. Anyways, moving on to one that's maybe a little less insane. Number two, Toy Guru. Nikki, walk us through your business model. How do you make money? All of our members obviously pay a monthly membership fee. We have plans that start at $35 a month, and they go all the way oh. up to $89 a month. Though the company, branded as the Netflix of toys, got a $200,000 investment from both Kevin O'Leary and Mark Cuban, Toy Guru filed for bankruptcy just one year after appearing on Shark Tank. Great concept, but it proved unable to execute. I'm not even sure how a Netflix of toys would even function. Toys, unlike movies, tend to have a lot more wear and tear on them whenever kids are playing with them, so... Having toys shipped to your house and then sent back the same way that Netflix used to do in the beginning seems like it would just lead to a lot of broken toys, thus costing customers a whole lot more than the initial starting price. Just all in all a very untenable solution to a really non-existent problem. Number 3. Body Jack those seeking tight-toned muscles, a sleek slender waistline, a stronger core, and overall superior physical fitness, gimmicks and fads have come and gone. Barbara Kokorin and guest shark Kevin Harrington invested $180,000 in this push-up machine, but the company later failed for undisclosed reasons. My worst experience was working with a fast-talking cowboy selling exercise equipment who needed to lose 50 pounds. At least, that's what Barbara said when they were talking about the body jack. He said instead of losing 50 pounds, he lost them $50,000. It seems really weird that you might need a push-up machine, considering that you can just do push-ups by hopping on the ground and, you know, 
doing push-ups. That would be what most people would do in these circumstances. They would just do the exercise that's asked of them, instead of trying to spend hundreds of thousands of dollars on exercise equipment that'll let you do exactly what you can do at any other point in time. I mean, it's not the same thing as having a treadmill. A treadmill actively keeps you from going outside, so there's at least some merit in it. You can watch some Netflix while working on your treadmill. But when it comes to something like the body jack, you can just do push-ups indoors. Nothing is stopping you from doing that. But apparently Barbara and Kevin thought that there was some merit in this, and then lost a couple thousand dollars as a result. Oh well, things like this happen. Number four, Cubits. How much of your own money have you put into this? I've invested $60,000. Of your own money? Quite frankly, I had to borrow much of it. Damon John offered Cubit's owner, Mark Berginger, a $90,000 investment contingent on Mark getting a deal with one of the four major toy companies. Unfortunately, Cubit's didn't interest any of the toy companies, so <laughs> Mark's agreement with Damon ultimately fell through. If you've got a product that will not satisfy investors, then when you get people to invest in your product, they will not be satisfied. I know that sounds circular, but it's simply the way the world works. It might have been best if Mark had actually gotten some clout with any of the major toy companies to begin with before going on to Shark Tank. If Damon was going to make sure that he wouldn't actually invest anything until there was already some skin in the game from other major investors, then mayhap having some skin in the game from those other investors before going on to the Shark Tank would have been the best idea. Instead, he had to walk away from the Shark Tank with a chip on his shoulder to see if he could actually get some investment from the major toy companies. The pressure from that is already not a great thing to deal with, but having to actually deal with the fallout of not being able to get those deals means that your pride and joy will ultimately all come falling down. It sucks, but it's definitely a lesson in being prepared. Number five, you smell soap. Hi, my name is Megan Cummins. My company is You Smell, and I'm seeking a $55,000 investment. You Smell is a new luxury soap brand that's a breath of fresh air and an oftentimes snooty market. After Megan Cummins pitched her luxury soap company to the Sharks, she walked away with an investment from Robert Hurivac. But Megan's business relationship with Robert soon went south, and the two later parted ways. I should have gone with Mark Cuban. Robert was shaking my hands as Mark was meeting his offer. It all happened so fast, and I had no time to think. I've heard nothing but great things about Mark from other people that he's invested in. Hindsight is 2020. The aftermath of Megan Cuban's appearance on the Shark Tank had us asking, deal or no deal? She'd come up with the idea for You Smell Soap in college, and was looking for a shark to help her bring it to life. After fielding multiple offers, she ended up with Robert Hurjavec, but that's just what we saw on TV. Megan reports that she attempted to contact her investor for six months, while Hurjavec claims that he slightly adjusted the contract to Cummins. This was something that she really couldn't accept. The company ended up closing in 2014, but Cummins has since decided that she was going to start a jewelry business called Sparkle Pop. At least there was a happy ending here, even if it wasn't for the original business. At least she managed to start her own business in another field. It does suck, though, that she wasn't able to get any extra funding or attention from her Yavac, but like she said, maybe she should have just gone with Mark Cuban instead. Hindsight is, after all, 2020. Number six, show no towels. There are over a thousand water parks in the United States. I figure if I can get at least 50 of them, and I, and I know I can, if I can get at least 50 of them to sell 20 towels a day, after Shelly Ehler pitched her towel poncho to the Sharks, she walked away with a deal from Lori Greener. Sadly though, things quickly fell apart off camera, and the company later had to close after a few years in business. She said that my Shark Tank deal with Lori Greener turned out to be crap. I once cursed my Shark partner for kicking me to the curb, but now I do actually kind of thank her. She taught me so much more than she thought she did, and none of it was about business. I mean, this really is a lot like having a parent kick you out. You end up learning a lot about the real world, not from your parent, but because you had no other choice. It's sad, but sometimes that is the way life is. Number seven, Grinds. Our product, Grinds Coffee Pouches, are filled with freshly ground coffee that's then flavored and supplemented with B vitamins and other important nutrients to keep you bright and alert. What do you get when you combine college kids, cram week, and coffee grinds? Well, if you ask Matt Canapa and Pat Peasett, you get a pretty decent Shark Tank pitch. 
The two former Cal Poly San Luis students found that chewing coffee grinds gave them a boost in energy, and they desperately needed that in their college days. They decided to formulate grinds, a product similar to chewing tobacco, but instead it was made from coffee. And they decided to make an on-camera deal with Damon John and Robert Hurjavec for $100,000 in exchange for a meager 15% of the company. But while it looked like it was a major success to viewers, the deal was never actually closed off screen. Nevertheless, the company is still up and running, so that's at least a positive. I don't know about you, but I prefer not having ground up coffee in my mouth. Although I have actually tried chewing coffee beans before, and it's not as unpleasant of an experience as you'd think. Still though, it seems like it would be really nasty to have the powder in your mouth. But who knows, maybe some people enjoy that stuff. I think most people, however, would probably decide that sticking with drinking their caffeine is better than trying to chew it. But with that said, that has been the seven biggest Shark Tank deals that flopped. Let us know what you thought in the comment section below. Was there a deal that you wish hadn't have flopped? And was there one that you thought definitely had more potential than some of the sharks did post-camera? Make sure to remember to subscribe and turn the bell notifications on in order to be notified whenever we release our daily videos. Finally, if you did subscribe, make sure to let us know in the comment section below so that you can be featured in a video shoutout at the end of the month. With all that said, we hope you enjoyed the video and we will see you in the next one.